When I was in the Army, one of my favorite assignments as a young infantry officer was my stint for a couple of years as the platoon leader for the battalion scout platoon. Now, the scout platoon was the reconnaissance unit for the 600-man battalion. I had a platoon of 24 men, and we operated most of the time well forward of the battalion, uh, re- doing reconnaissance, finding you know, the enemy that was supposed to be out there or finding you know, the terrain and, and checking all of that out. And as part of that, uh, we were trained uh, to use helicopters, and we spent a lot of time in and out of helicopters being inserted and extracted from small landing zones uh, in the middle of nowhere. Back then, our aviation units were still flying the, the old UH-1 helicopters, the Huey, which was the iconic helicopter of the Vietnam War. I know some of you in the audience today have some experience with this particular bird. And uh, in fact, many of our pilots in the mid-80s were still senior chiefs who had flown in Vietnam. And when you got into the helicopter, and I would get into the place where the platoon leader normally sits right behind the pilot, and uh, I would look right first at their shoulder boards to see what was on their flight suit. If I saw that it was a first lieutenant or someone like that who was my age, I knew that it was going to be a pretty wonky flight and that uh, I would have to fly with my map in my lap and to make sure I was watching carefully so that he didn't put us down in the wrong place. Because for him, that was no big deal. But if you're walking after they leave, if they put you in the wrong place and you have to walk further to get to where you were supposed to start in the first place, that's a problem. On the other hand, when I got in the helicopter and I saw the four squares of a chief warrant officer I knew to pull the seatbelt a little bit tighter because these guys flew like they were still in combat in Vietnam. We took some harrowing rides with chief warrant officers. They flew so close to the deck that you could sometimes hear the tops of the trees getting clipped by the skids of the helicopter. They would fly fast and low, and when they'd come to flare into the landing zone, they'd flare very hard and then put the helicopter down, but not all the way down. They would hover about two to three feet off the ground, which meant that you had to chuck your rucksack and and jump out of the helicopter before you rolled up and took off. Now, the reason they didn't land was because in Vietnam, they knew that sometimes the landing zones were mined by the enemy. And so they didn't want to land a helicopter on a landmine. But it's okay if you as the infantryman jump out and hit a landmine because you are a lot less expensive than a helicopter. Well, I got to know these pilots really well and their crew chiefs. And uh, the choppers themselves fascinated me. I mean, it doesn't look like something that should be able to fly, and yet yet it really does. And I chatted with them about their equipment, and one of the things they referred to a lot in the helicopter was a component called the Jesus nut. Now, its main, its main uh, official title was the main rotor retaining nut, but they called it the Jesus nut. Why? Well, because it was the nut that attached the rotor to the rest of the helicopter. And so if that nut were to fail, the rotor would fly off. At that point, all you had left to do was to pray to Jesus because you were going to get really soon a chance to meet him. I think about that Jesus nut, the thing that holds everything together in a helicopter. Every time I read Colossians 1, when Paul says that in him, in Jesus, all things hold together. He is the linkage between God and humanity. But like the inner workings of the Jesus nut, we might wonder how it all works. In what sense is Jesus both divine and human? And how does he represent both? This was the question that the framers of the creeds had to deal with. You'll notice in both the apostles and the Nicene creeds, the longest sections are all about Jesus. And that's because the creeds are designed to settle the question of Jesus' relationship to God the Father. Is he of the same substance as God, or is he of similar or lesser substance? Was Jesus preeminent and preexistent with God the Father, or was he created by God? These were important questions, and they still are. 
then as now, different ideas about Jesus were circulating. Was he a simple human with a, some kind of God consciousness? Was he really divine and only appeared to be human? Was he co-equal with God or a lesser being? Was he as the great moral, was he a great moral teacher and example, or was he the eternally begotten Son of God? C.S. Lewis asked the question famously, was he a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord? How we answer the question of Jesus' identity is the central question of the Christian faith. It's the belief that holds everything else together, and that's why it's the central section of the creeds. Since the beginning of Christianity, Jesus has been seen as the one in, ho- in whom full humanity and full divinity dwell fully. That's an important truth, not just in terms of getting the metaphysics right, but also in terms of what this implies about God's mission toward us and toward His creation. And so we turn today to a couple of scriptures that give us a framework for understanding what it means when we say that we believe in Jesus Christ. The Apostles' Creed says that we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And the Nicene Creed goes further, as you remember. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, and through Him all things were made. Both the creeds and the icon that we've been looking at understand this truth, that in Jesus Christ, everything from our understanding of God to our understanding of humanity to our understanding of creation all holds together. And that's where Paul begins his letter to the church at Colossae. And it's a great place for us to begin our understanding of this vital section of the creed. Now, if you are a subscriber to my blog, you know that this week I wrote five different blog posts that go through the the creed in some detail. And uh, if you want to get into the weeds on this, there's an opportunity for you to do so. But what we're going to look at today are a couple of these passages that really just sort of give us a a 10,000-foot view, if you will, or a view from above the treetops if we're using it in a helicopter sense. Now, the situation in Colossae was a lot like that in which the framers of the creeds found themselves. There were some who were there in the Colossian church who were questioning the adequacy of Christ. They believed, some of them, in the Gnostic idea, Gnosticism, an an old heresy that still raises itself from time to time, the idea that matter was evil, the body is evil, and therefore the incarnate Christ must have been inferior to God the Father if He was taking up a human body. Perhaps He was even inferior to angels, because after all, they don't have human bodies either. Well, Paul is going to set out to correct this heresy right out of the chute when he writes to the church. And he does so in chapter 1 by either composing or quoting what many scholars believe was an early Christian hymn. Hymns, of course, express poetically deeper truths as we see in our own hymnody. Well, I'm going to suggest that in this passage, these five verses in Colossians, there are three important linkages that are essential for us to understand who Jesus is according to the Scriptures and according to the creeds. These linkages are as vital to uh, the, the Christian faith as the Jesus nut is to the helicopter, because without them, things begin to fall apart. When we understand and maintain them, however, we begin to see God's great plan for His creation unfold, and we begin to see our part in it. So the first link we want to look at is the link between Jesus and the Father. In other words, in Jesus, we discover who God is. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation. As we said last week when talking about God the Father, there's a certain amount of mystery about who God is, that God is personal, but also God is spirit. As another old hymn puts it, we sing it here on occasion, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. But here we learn that while God is inaccessible to our eyes, God is not unknowable. Rather, God is made known in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is borrowing some imagery here from Judaism 
which saw wisdom as the image and representation of God and the means through which God brought forth his creation. In Proverbs, for example, wisdom is personified metaphorically as a woman. Of course, all the women in the crowd say amen, right? That's exactly the way it should be. She shouts in the streets in Proverbs, calling the people to hear her wise counsel. Wisdom is thus not something created by God, but rather something that proceeds from God as part of God's very nature. The early hymn thus begins by saying that Jesus is the akon, or the image of God, the invisible made visible, not a metaphor as in Proverbs, but God literally incarnated in a human being, conceived by the Spirit and born of a woman, not a created being, but one who is part of God's very nature. That's what the word begotten actually means. It means the Son is not something made by the Father as part of His creation, but that he is rather an extension or expansion, a person out of the Father's own existence and nature. In the beginning of John's gospel, we see this even more clearly. Another word for wisdom in Greek is the logos or the word. And John says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The wisdom of God, the nature of God is thus personified fully in Jesus the Word made flesh who came to dwell among us. He is both with God and is God. And this is important because when we Christians talk about God, we're not talking as many in the world do of a nebulous concept or a force, nor are we talking about a God who is capricious or random and out to get us. When we talk about God, we understand God through the lens and through the person of Jesus Christ. He is our linkage to the Father. What does Jesus tell his disciples? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. One of them, Philip, asked him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, don't you get it, Philip? If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And when we understand this linkage between Jesus and the Father, we understand that God's very nature is good and loving and forgiving and willing to sacrifice himself for us. The great Methodist missionary E. Stanley Jones put it this way, I look up through Jesus the Son, and now I know what God is like. God is a Christ-like God, and if so, then God is a good God and trustable. I could think of nothing higher I could be content with nothing less. Now, last week I showed you this icon of the Trinity by Russian iconographer Andrei Rublev. And just like in the creeds, Jesus sits in the center as the focal point. The Father points to him, indicating that his purposes are being fulfilled through the Son. The Son gazes back at the Father, receiving his glory and his mission through him. And though they are distinct, they are still one. As Jesus told his disciples, I and the Father are one. To see Jesus is to see God. To know Jesus is to know the very nature and heart of God. And this is the vital link. Because if Jesus is not God, well, then none of this really matters. If Jesus is not God, you and I are wasting our time this morning. Maybe he's an example of a good human life you'd want to emulate, or maybe he's just another example of a martyr who who died for a cause. But if he's not really God, mm, you know, there's other things we could be doing today. But here's the thing. If Jesus is God, and we believe he is, then my friends, nothing else matters. That's the whole nut. It's everything to us. It's the hinge point in history, and in Him, all things hold together. And that's the second link we want to look at, because Jesus is not only the link to the Father, He's also the link between the old creation and the new creation. As Paul puts it, for in Him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through Him and for Him. John adds that all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. 
Jesus Christ says this old hymn is the one in whom and for whom the creation was made in the first place. It was made as his dwelling place, God's dwelling place. And when you pull that thread all the way through the scriptures, you see the links everywhere. In Genesis, for example, you read Genesis 1, this orderly six-day account of creation. And then on the seventh day, what happens? God rests. Now, we often think of God, you know, taking an iced tea and kicking his feet up and saying, that was a lot of work. That's the kind of rest I need to take. No, that's not exactly what that means. What it means is that this particular text is a temple building narrative. It's much more than simply scientific explanation, which we try to make it through our post-enlightenment lens. What we're looking at in Genesis 1 is a temple building narrative. And when you build a temple, the last thing that happens is that the God moves in to the temple. His glory rests there. And that's what happens on the seventh day of creation. And that gets signified in Exodus through the creation of the tabernacle, where the Shekinah glory of God rests there in the tent and dwells with God's people, travels with them by day and by night. And later on in Jerusalem, the temple is built where the Shekinah glory of God dwells. And that's why when John says in his gospel this profound truth that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, literally tabernacled among us, that Jesus comes as the new temple, the place where heaven and earth meet, the place where God comes to dwell with his people. And if you don't believe that, go to the end of the Bible and go to Revelation. In Revelation 21, the last image is of the heavenly Jerusalem coming down down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband coming to earth and receiving this connection between heaven and earth. And it says that in that new city, in that new creation, there is no temple. Why? Because the temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, God coming to dwell with his people in person. It's a profound truth. God the Father, in and through God the Son, created the world good because he intends to dwell there. When we see the beauty of creation, and I don't know if you've been driving around the last couple days, but man, the leaves, isn't it beautiful? This, this, this is one of the reasons I wanted to move back home big time. I love October in Pennsylvania to be able to see the leaves and the beauty. I was over in Gettysburg yesterday and just, just marveling at the beauty we have around us. When you see that, You have to remember, it's like that because of Jesus. And when we see, on the other hand, how creation has been exploited and distorted by human sin, it's then that we remember that Jesus came to redeem it and is coming again to finish the work. God is not going to abandon his creation. He's coming to remake and renew it and make it good again. The evil, sin, and death in the world isn't what God intended from the beginning. But the scriptures and the creeds proclaim to us that in Jesus, God has acted decisively to heal the world. N.T. Wright puts it this way, the Jesus through whom the world was made in the first place is the same Jesus through whom the world has now been redeemed. The old creation corrupted by sin and death will be made new. That linkage is depicted so beautifully in the Rublev icon by the colors that the sun wears, the brown of earth layered with the blue of heaven, with a streak of gold symbolizing his divinity in the midst of his humanity. Heaven and earth, God and humanity come together in him. They hold together in him. And that's the third link, the linkage between Jesus and humanity and the good news of the cross and the resurrection. When humanity was bound by Adam's sin, Jesus comes as the perfect human, the new Adam, launching a new humanity renewed by defeating sin and death. And so Paul says he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. The one in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell went through death itself so that through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood of the cross. See, the good news is that God in the person of Jesus chooses to deal with the sin and death that has invaded his good creation by going through death and out the other side on res- in resurrection. 
That's why the creed makes a very distinct statements about what Jesus does. He's crucified, died, buried, descended to the dead, rose on the third day, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. That's the sequence. Every piece of that matters. Only God could do this on our behalf. No substitute could do it. God has come to do the work himself, taking on the pain of sin and carrying it through death to a victorious resurrection. That Jesus is the firstborn from the dead means that his resurrection is the foretaste of our own. That we will be renewed people in a renewed creation. What God intended from the beginning will be, will be brought to reality in the end. Notice that in the Rublev icon, that behind the figure of Jesus, there in the center, there is a tree. It's a symbol of the tree of life in Genesis. Remember in Genesis 2, there are two trees. There's the tree of life, from where you get eternal life, and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, eat from the tree of life all you want, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What, do Adam, what does Adam do? Adam and Eve, they choose the one thing they can't have. Like a bunch of children, you tell them, tell them you can't do it, they're going to do it anyway. But what happens when they do that? They lose access to the tree of life. They lose access to eternal life. How is that access granted again? It's granted because Jesus Christ goes to the tree of Golgotha and dies there for us, opening the way again for us to receive new life and eternal life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we come to the Father through Him. This is the good news proclaimed by the Scriptures and by the creeds. That in Jesus, God become human. All things hold together. In Him, humanity and divinity hold together. In Him, heaven and earth hold together. In Him, God and humans are reconciled. In Him, creation holds together and finds its true purpose. In Him, the church is held together. In Him, the defeat of death and the promise of new life are held together. In Him, love and hope are held together. So you remove Jesus and everything is lost. Now, pilots will tell you that the failure of the Jesus nut is a rare occurrence. Still, the crew chief, the sergeant who's in charge of the maintenance of the helicopter, will crawl up on top of that bird every morning to make sure that Jesus nut is still secure. They have a huge honking wrench they put on there and torque it down to make sure it's good to go. The life of the pilots and the crew and the grunts inside all depend on that component being right. Our lives both now and in the future depend on the Jesus who was not a nut, but who is God. And in a world where people are constantly trying to fashion a Jesus that suits their own agendas, our understanding of him needs constant maintenance and rechecking. Saying the creed, memorizing it, measuring false teaching against it is vital. That's why we put the creed after the sermon, you know, just to make sure that whatever was just said isn't heresy. It's a check for you every time. Do you get that? I hope you do. You should have it in your back of your mind every time you hear a sermon. I know I do. Here's an experiment for you to try this week. As you go about your daily life listening to the news having conversations with friends or overhearing conversations in the coffee shop, I want to invite you to listen for ways in which people refer to God. Politicians are doing it all the time, even referring to Jesus and Christianity. For example, when someone yells out Jesus Christ on the golf course, it's usually not an act of praise. You know what I'm saying? Who are they referring to? What kind of Jesus are they looking for? My guess is that you'll hear a lot of heresy out there if you're listening real closely. Ultimately, our job isn't to simply argue, though, for what's in the creed. It's to live it out and to demonstrate what it looks like in real life. Because the Jesus who is God in the flesh also reveals to us what it means to be truly human, to be a people on a mission. 
He is the image of God, the image to which all the rest of us are to be tuned. As Paul says in Romans, we are to be conformed, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's God's goal for us. And that's important because we also remember that the purpose of Jesus isn't merely to keep us aloft in the spiritual sense. Just like the purpose of the Jesus nut isn't just to keep the chopper in the air. The chopper actually has a bigger purpose. The ultimate purpose of the Jesus nut is to keep the helicopter flying so that it can carry out its mission of ferrying troops into battle. Jesus' purpose is to save us, but then to convey us into combat against the forces of sin and death. The scriptures and the creeds thus remind us that God in Jesus Christ has a mission to redeem his good creation, and he calls us to join him in that mission. Now, it can be a dangerous mission, but it's one that will ultimately be victorious because we know that in the cross and in the empty tomb, it's a victory he's already won. To follow him, however, we have to be clear about who he is the one in whom all things hold together. And because he is the one in whom all things hold together, he is also the one who can hold you together when things are falling apart. That's the best part of the creed. God has come in person in Jesus to make you whole. Do you know him today? Have you experienced his love, his grace, his healing power? In a minute, we're going to come to the communion table, the same table to which the Trinity invites us. I want you to come and meet Jesus today, maybe for the first time. Come and experience what he has to offer you. His forgiveness, his grace, his love, his healing. Come and let him hold you together today. Thanks be to God. Amen.